Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. I trust you had a good dinner break. I'd like to welcome all of the delegates that are here on this platform and also all the folks that are watching us via the live streams, either on the Sins Facebook channel or our YouTube channel. It's my great pleasure this evening to be able to introduce you to this evening's guest speaker, Diana Butler Bass. Diana is an award-winning author and internationally known public speaker and thought leader on issues of spirituality, religion, culture, and politics. She's appeared on CNN, MSNBC, PBS, CBS, and Fox. Sorry about that, Diana. <laughs> Has been interviewed on numerous radio programs, including shows on NPR, CBC, and Sirius XM and has had her work featured in numerous print and online newspapers and magazines, including Time, USA Today, and the Los Angeles Times. She was a founding blogger for both BeliefNet and Huffington Post Religion, and her bylines include the Washington Post and the Atlantic. She's preached and taught in hundreds of church, college, and conference venues in North America and beyond. She is the author of 11 books. The most recent two, first being Freeing Jesus, Rediscovering Jesus as Friend, Teacher, Savior, Lord, Way, and Presence, that was published this year in March, an invitation to experience Jesus beyond the narrow confines that we built around him. And in 2019, Grateful, the transformative power of giving thanks, in which she offers suggestions for reclaiming gratitude that can lead to a greater connection with God, our loved ones, our world, and even our souls. Born in Baltimore, Diana was raised in Scottsdale, Arizona, and she loves Santa Barbara, California as her sole hometown. She lives in Alexandria, Virginia with her husband, Richard Bass, and their dog, Rowan. When it's safe, she balances travel, which she loves, with her concerns for Virginia politics, a passion for environmental issues, supporting local farms, reading poetry, cooking, gardening, Washington Nationals baseball, and Duke basketball. I'd like to add the Montreal Canadiens hockey team to your list. Diana, you have a lot of fans north of the 49th parallel, and many of us have come to know you through your extensive writings. I count it as a distinct pleasure that I've been able to come to know you in a pixelated form during the conversations that we've had leading up to this assembly. I welcome you on behalf of the Synod and invite you to address us. Welcome, Diana. Thank you so much, Michael. And not just pixelated form, but through uh, Twitter and other social media are certainly ways that we have come to know each other in the last uh, year and a half, two years. Well, oh my gosh, this is just such a strange format. I think that after a year and a half, I'm still not quite used to it. But I am glad to be with you all and I miss you. I really am sad that the border is closed and that I can't be in Canada because I think that those of you who have heard me before know how much I appreciate and enjoy uh, some good Northern hospitality. So I am sorry about that, but it is a pleasure to be here with you in this way. And it is an interesting time to talk about the theme of your conference, behold, I do a new thing. Behold, I or I'm doing a new thing. Um, those verses can sometimes seem a little, a little frightening. So what I want to do tonight is to share about new things and new ways, and to talk ultimately about how Jesus is the way, but we're going to get to that through the Hebrew scriptures. And um, I am really looking forward to this journey with you because I have had a great time reading uh, from the Hebrew scriptures in preparation for being with you um, this evening. 
Of course, the verse, Behold, I am doing a new thing, comes from Isaiah 43, um, verse 19. And I'm gonna, I've got some papers next to me. I'll be reading a bit from the Bible. So if you hear things, uh, that's, that's what's going on here. Uh, the, the verse is, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I just love that verse. Um, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. That set of verses from Isaiah 43, um, scholars believe was written in the context of the Babylonian captivity. And so the people of Israel were indeed, as it says in other parts of scripture, they, they sat down by the waters of Babylon and they wept. And so here we have this really interesting verse, this promise of coming out of captivity, out of exile. I'm about to do a new thing. This is essentially a kind of a rehearsing of the Exodus. You are going to be free. And this appeal to the water is that the water is of Babylon or not long, no longer going to be a place of weeping, but instead there will be springs in the desert, that the desert will bloom, that the people will drink. And what an incredible promise. The world is about to be freed, liberated, and turned upside down. That the waters that we're weeping will be the waters of celebration, of new life, and of birth. And so those are incredible verses. And in some ways, they're a little bit strange um, as a verse for a church conference. Um, you're not the first people that I have seen use this verse to want to talk about the future of church and what might be coming. As a matter of fact, I've spoken at a good number of conferences through the years that have used this verse, Behold, I am doing a new thing, as a theme for their conference. Now, part of the reason why I think it's odd, I mentioned a moment ago, is that um, when you tell people you're going to do a new thing, there can be some different reactions. Um, there are some people who love new things, who are happy to do new things all the time. I am mostly one of those people. I love innovation and creativity, and I'm always happy to try uh, new ideas. I, my husband says I throw out about a thousand new ideas a day, and I love to see which, which of them stick. Um, so I'm kind of a person who appreciates the idea of a new thing. And yet I also in this past year, have not been so terribly happy about new things. Uh, the pandemic is new. Wearing masks all the time is new. Being in isolation is new. Having the border between the United States and Canada is new. Sitting in my office for the last 14, 15 months in the same chair, speaking to really wonderful people that I'd rather see face to face. That's all new. And I can't tell you that I really like any of that. And so when it comes to saying, behold, I'm doing a new thing, there is often a tendency for us to say, well, wait a second. Oh, what kind of new thing? If we know what sort of new thing is happening, we might be more excited about it and perhaps less apprehensive about it. So when we just simply put out this verse and say, behold, I'm doing a new thing related to church, um, that can be a little bit of a, of a mixed bag. Well, the, the second part of this that's, I think, a little, a little strange as well, is that when we read this verse, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Th this is, of course, God talking to the people of Israel. Um, it's, it's very Lutheran to appeal to a verse where God is the main actor and that God is the one doing the new thing. But on the other hand, despite the fact that it is very Lutheran, it's all grace, grace alone, God's work. I understand that. I'm an Episcopalian, but I do love Lutheran theology and know a good deal of it. And so, so I, I, I get the sort of the emphasis there. 
on God's grace flowing out over the deserts, God's water that invites us, etc. cetera. Um, but on the other hand, when we're at a church conference, uh, we're the ones who are doing an awful lot of work. And so behold, I do a new thing when, hey, we're the ones writing the resolutions and doing all the voting does seem to leave us a bit out of the equation. So here we have this incredible verse, uh, but it really does seem to put the major action of the freedom, liberation, the newness, the innovation, the creativity, the remaking of the world, uh, all of that stuff, it seems to put it solely in, in God's hands. And while the Protestant Diana, uh, who understands and loves Protestant theology, approves of that in terms of understanding God's grace, there is also a sort of very practical Diana that asks, well, what is there left for, for me to do? And what is there left for us to do um, in community? Well, in my search to think through new ways and new things um, in being with you tonight, I actually went over to the other place in scripture where the, the same idea appears. And so I'm going to shift my Bible here uh, where I have a Bible in my little stack uh, turned to Jeremiah. Um, Jeremiah was probably written um, somewhere around the same time that part of Isaiah was written. Uh, most scholars think that Jeremiah was written during the Babylonian captivity. And that so, so the context of Jeremiah is essentially the, the same. It's a people who have been in exile, who have been oppressed by a foreign government, who have been held in slavery, um, and they have not known their home. And they've been away from Israel, away from Jerusalem for a very long time. And so um, in, in Jeremiah, the same idea of behold, I'm doing a new thing appears. It appears in Jeremiah 31. And um, I'm just going to read you these verses. They're a lot less well known than the Isaiah verses. And so here we have in Jeremiah 31, set up road signs, put up guideposts. Take note of the highway, the road that you take. Return, O virgin Israel. Return to your towns. How long will you wander, O unfaithful daughter? The Lord will create a new thing on earth. A woman will surround a man. Well, now you know why those verses are a lot less widely read than the ones in Isaiah. Clearly, Isaiah is a way better poet than Jeremiah. Um, but there's also this sort of odd ending to that verse where it says, the Lord is going to create a new thing on earth. And then this, what is probably one of the most controversial verses in the prophets, no one knows how to preach on it. No one really knows what it means. A, a woman will surround a man. The, the best sort of guess we have about that verse is that it's not that different from what is happening in Isaiah. In Isaiah, there is an ecological reversal of things. Behold, I'm going to do a new thing. And the, the environment, the physical environment of Israel is altered, that there is going to be water in the desert. So there's going to be an ecological turning upside down of what you remember home being like, dry, dry all those things, but instead water is going to course forth. Well, this apparently is a social reversal where the Lord is going to create a new thing. Israel is going to come back from exile, that the unfaithfulness that had put them in exile is going to be reversed. There is going to be liberation. There is going to be freedom. And there will be a social reversal of roles instead of men being the sort of the, the patriarchs that are in charge of society, there's going to be this unexpected thing that occurs, that women are going to surround men. That's kind of exciting. Um, and so we have an ecological reversal and we have a social reversal. These things are going to happen when Israel is restored to a new place. The other reason I like these Jeremiah verses, despite that, 
that kind of wacky clause at the end of the of this the the two short verses is that Jeremiah is a little more focused on what we get to do in relationship to this. Whereas Isaiah, it's all God. Um, in Jeremiah, we get this other difference. Set up road signs, put up guideposts, take note of the highway, the road that you take. Jeremiah is telling us to pay attention, pay attention to how we got here and pay attention to how we're going to return and mark the way guideposts, signs, pay attention to the way, the highway, the road that you take, the road that is the road of this new creation, this freedom, this liberation from, from exile. Well, that's not the first time Jeremiah talks about ways in his book. About 10 chapters before this particular verse appears, Jeremiah will say to um, the people of Israel, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. And in a moment when Israel is incredibly worried about their fate, that they are all going to die, that there's a military in, in, intrusion into, um, into Judah, um, they don't know what to do, everything is inside out, upside down, they are frightened. Jeremiah comes on this scene and says, behold, I lay before you today a way of life and a way of death. And you're going to get to choose. You're going to get to participate in your fate. And so that kind of is a fascinating thing where he links this way, the idea of a way, of a highway, to a new creation, to God's work of liberation, God doing a new thing. Well, what is the way? What is the way? Biblical scholars have long noted that there are incredible parallels between Jeremiah and the book of Deuteronomy. They are believed to be written just about the same time towards that same set of circumstances that Israel is in exile um, in Babylon or has only just returned. Uh, to, to Jerusalem. It's a community that has been through great suffering. And it's a community that is now trying to understand uh, how God was working, uh, what they did uh, to get themselves in this sort of terrible situation, and how they'll get out of it. And so the book of Deuteronomy, which is traditionally ascribed to Moses, but was written, of course, much later than that. Um, the, the book of Deuteronomy is really Moses's long, it, the, what, they, what the author of Deuteronomy does is create this long address in the voice of Moses to um, try to call the people of Israel back to the most important things about who they are. And so the setting of the book, it's a beautiful literary book. Um, it, it, it is in some ways Deuteronomy. Christians don't know really how to read it. And we think it's, it might be dull, uh, but it isn't. It's, a, it's this long piece of rhetoric about memory, about who Israel is. And the way it's set up is that, that Moses is standing on a mountain um, before the people enter Israel after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And so they're gazing into the land of milk and honey, the land of promise. And Moses, their leader, the lawgiver, the liberator, is standing in front of them and he's telling them a story, a story about who they are in God. And this goes on for 30 some chapters. And as you get near the end, Moses says this to the people of Israel. See, I have set before you today life and good and death and evil. I charge you to love God and go in God's way. 
to keep God's commands, statutes, and laws. This is the people of Israel standing in a liminal place between the wandering in the desert, the same desert that Isaiah has talked about as fearsome and without water, the desert that they had to cross to go into exile from Jerusalem into Babylon. So here they are with Moses standing between that fearsome place, that desert, the howling desert, where they've been tested and where, where, where frightening things have happened. God has been present, but it has not been easy. And the promised land, it's liminal space. They're between what was and what will be. And in that space, Moses says, I set before you two ways, a way of life and good, a way of death and evil. I charge you, love God. And go in God's way. Embrace the commands, the statutes, and the laws. Now, for us as Christians, this is not like Moses saying to the people of Israel, um, here it's the rule book. And if you break these rules, uh, terrible things are going to happen to you. That's not really what the law is for Israel. The law is the breath of God, the presence of God embodied in these words, these treasured words, inscribe them on your hearts. Never forget them all day. Meditate on the law. The law is life. The law is beauty. The law is the the heart of God, the desire of God. And in the Hebrew scriptures, the law isn't written down on these, these two tables, the Ten Commandments. And the first table is all about how to love God, have no idols, worship the Lord your God only. Um, and the second table is about loving your neighbor. Don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't do all these things that violate the integrity and dignity of the people that you live with. And so that's what, that's what this is about, is that, that I charge you to love God and go in God's way, the way of the love of God and the way of love of neighbor. Hold those commands, those statutes, those laws to your hearts because that is the breath, the desire, the longing of God for how we should live, how the people of Israel shall live in this beautiful promised land. That's how you're going to live when you get out of this liminal space. And so Jeremiah is reminding the people of that. Jeremiah is reminding, I set before you a way of life and a way of death. He's echoing Moses. There's no surprise there. If you know anything about how the Old Testament is written, Jeremiah and Deuteronomy are a pair. They're about life after exile, a life where you have been liberated and then exiled, and now you're about to be liberated again. Life. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Follow these statutes. Let the breath of God, the intention of God, the desire of God be your entire way. I talk about all of that because that's where, behold, I am doing a new thing. It takes me. It took me right into the heart of the most important story in the Hebrew scripture, a story of Exodus, a story of wandering, a story of homecoming, a story of exile. There's a lot of wandering around in the Hebrew scriptures. If you turn to the New Testament, the language 
of the way is all over the gospels and it is over the all over the epistles as well the earliest christians were called people of the way and jesus talks about the way jesus says in matthew I think this is a fascinating verse, one that most preachers hate preaching on, but it's in the Sermon on the Mount. Now you have to get what's happening here is that Matthew is depicting Jesus as the new Moses. As Moses was the lawgiver and the liberator of the people of Israel, so Jesus is going to be the lawgiver and the liberator of the new Israel that is emerging from this long diaspora, from this horrible slavery of the Roman Empire, from this exile toward the kingdom of God. And so Jesus, the writer of Matthew, is making this clear, clear storytelling uh, uh, narrative clear I mean, you can't miss it if you know if if you're paying attention that Moses and and Jesus are on the same par. They're the they're they're the same. Jesus, the new Moses, and so Jesus is standing on a mount, the Sermon on the Mount, and he says this in Matthew chapter seven: "Enter by the narrow gate. Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction." And there are many who go in it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, there are few who will find it. This is clearly Jesus appealing to those same verses, that there is a way that leads to death and there is a way that leads to life. And Jesus talks about how the, the, the way that leads to death is, is wide. And the way that leads to life is narrow. Um, the, the, the way that leads to destruction is easier to find. And, um, so, you know, we have interpreted that through, lots of people interpret that through Christian history to mean sort of like, um, you know, you have to really clamp down. You're going to, there's only a few people who are going to go to heaven. As a matter of fact, there are entire denominations that sort of have to try to figure out how many people will be in heaven because the gate's so narrow and only a few people are going to go through and they, you know, close off any possibility of Christian universalism by this gate and all that kind of thing. But that's really kind of a misreading of this verse. I, I really, the, the, this verse is followed by it follows a really beautiful passage in Matthew where um, it's the ask, seek, and knock, and it shall be given to you um, comes right before this. The idea that God is a wildly gifting God who gives things to, um, to God's people in the same way a loving father throws gifts at his children. And so it's the passage is set up by love. And interestingly enough, the verse that immediately proceeds, enter by the narrow gate, which we often use to exclude others. The verse that immediately proceeds that is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Basically, love your neighbor as yourself. And so this is the setup for Jesus talking about the way that leads to death and the way that leads to life is to talk about a wildly gifting God who loves, loves creation in the same way that a, 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 a father pours out gifts on his children. It's all about this, this loving God, all love, all gifts, all the time. And, you know, do unto your neighbor as you would have them do unto yourself. Love of God, love of neighbor. That's what precedes the way. And so Jesus here, the, the author of Matthew, is clearly hearkening back to these same passages, this Jeremiah idea, the idea of Moses' valedictory address. Behold, I am doing a new thing. 
behold, I am doing a new thing. You are about to enter into the promised land. You're about to leave what you knew and the gates are opening toward the promise of milk and honey, streams in the wilderness, a, a world where social roles are, 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 are really turned upside down and inside out. The new thing, it's all caught up in the way. Not only does Jesus teach that in Matthew, but of course there is a further explication of that in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is written probably about a decade after Matthew. I have always thought whenever I read John that John was probably familiar with Matthew. There's echoes throughout John on, uh, on, some, on some very important issues. And one of them is, of course, is that in John, we get the words put into Jesus' storytelling, is that Jesus says, I am the gate. Uh, clearly, enter through the narrow gate. I am the gate. And so we have that idea is that Jesus somehow isn't just talking about a way uh, where one where there's a wide gate and a narrow gate, but that Jesus is the gate. Um, again, we get to that language and we think, oh, gatekeepers, exclusion, rules. We got to follow this stuff. It's going to be small. Heaven's going to be tiny. There's a lot of stuff blocking the way. Um, but the lovely thing about that passage in John is that when Jesus says, I'm the gate. It's also the, the good shepherd passage. I'm the gate. I'm the good shepherd. Uh, the sheep will go, the sheep will know my name and they will go in and out of the gate. The gate goes two ways. The gate comes in where the sheep are safe and the gate goes out so that the sheep can go and wander in the fields so they can drink water in the fields. And the sheep know the shepherd's voice. Jesus is the gate and Jesus is the good shepherd. And of course, the gospel of John also has, I am the way. The clearest sort of articulation of the way for Christians. I don't know how you feel about that verse. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. A lot of our brother and sister Christians use that as an, another verse of exclusion, like the narrow and the wide gates. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's very nice. That's very poetic. That's very mystical. Um, but then no one comes to the Father except by me. Well, this is where I want to finish my remarks with you tonight around this verse. Behold, I am doing a new thing. And yet it's like, behold, I'm doing a new thing. It's coming. It's not here yet. And there is this old thing over here that you're very used to. The fascinating thing about the I am the way, the truth, and the life verse is that it is a liminal verse. It is situated in the Gospel of John in a very interesting place. It is situated in Jesus's valedictory address. In John chapter 13, the, the narrative of John has turned toward the end of the story. It is clear the disciples are really worried that stuff is happening. They're getting towards, they're, they're at Passover. Um, there's, there's contention. There's opposition. There's religious leaders who are clamping down on them. There's certainly political leaders who have always been keeping an eye on them and don't like them. And they're worried because Jesus, their friend, their teacher, the one that they expect to be the lawgiver and the liberator is beginning to talk about death. What is going on here? 
And Jesus says to them, don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And he starts trying to comfort them. And there's a lot of comforting action that goes on through 13. And then you get to 14 and Thomas pops out and says, but wait a second, you're, you're, you're going away and we don't know where you're going. And this is very upsetting to us. So it's like, they haven't been listening for this whole part of the early part of the discourse. And then Jesus dives back in and says, I am the way and the truth and the life. I'm the way. You've been with me all this time. On the way, I'm the way. That's, I'm going. I, where am I going? I'm not going away. I am the way. And so this is an attempt for Jesus to remind them that Jesus was the way and that it gave them a sense of life. It showed them a different way of living, a way of loving God and loving their neighbors, a way that they never expected of freedom and joy and friendship and all of the things that they had always hoped for. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's like Moses. I lay before you today two ways, a way of life and goodness, a way of death and evil. I'm the way, Jesus says. I'm the gate. I am the good shepherd. It's comfort. And that's important to remember because Jesus is not giving them a discourse on what the, the eternal state of Buddhists, Hindus, and Jews or secular people is going to be. There is not a word in this whole section of scripture about anybody being worried about anybody else's eternal state. This is not about who's going to be in heaven after they die and whether or not only a few people who happen to bear the name of, of Jesus and who happen to be baptized in just the right way or who happen to follow all the rules, that those are the people going to be in heaven. This is not what this is about. There is not a person sitting in this room with Jesus while this discourse is going on who thinks that this is about the eternal state of Buddhists. It is not about that. It is about their fear. It is about their fear that something new is about to happen and they don't think they are going to like it, even though it has something to do with the kingdom of God and the promised land and everything being turned upside down and inside out and water in the desert and the first being last and women being, uh, you know, there is no male or female, there is no slave nor free, there is only, there is only one in Christ, but they're afraid. They don't know what that's going to look like. And Jesus is saying, it's okay. You know what this looks like. You've been with me. I am the way. If you experience love and friendship and joy and care and miraculous healing and all these other things, it's because you've been on this way with me. I am the way. Don't, do not be afraid of what is coming. And then that other verse, the other part of the verse, no one comes to the Father except by me. You know, in English, we think, oh, that's it. That's the point. See, it does. It means the Buddhists and Muslims and Jews, they aren't going to be in heaven. Nobody, who, people who don't obey the rules, people who don't get this, they're not going to be there either. It's just not about that. There's another way we use, you can use the word accept to mean exception, you know, exclusion in English. Um, but there's another way to use it. And this is also tricky in the Greek, is that this word can be like, the house was on fire and there was no way to get out except that someone opened the door. Exception means to make a way possible that wasn't possible before. Someone has done something that creates a new possibility, an exception to the rule. You are not going to burn down in the house. What was impossible has become possible because someone has made a way for a new possibility. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except that I've made a way. And so what are we to do? Jeremiah says, set up the road signs, put up the guideposts, take note of the highway, the road that you take. The Lord will create a new thing on earth. That's what it's all about. Is that it's not about it's not about us working towards heaven. It's not about life after death. It's about about now. The road is open. A way has been created. Put up the signs. Take note of the of the route. A way is open that life can really, truly be lived. It's not a way of life just in heaven. It's a way of life here. It's a way out of exile, a way that we live together with joy and justice and freedom. It is a way that is God-breathed that is full of grace, that is embodied in the beautiful law of the two tables of the Ten Commandments, the love of God, the love of, of neighbor, and that we as Christians believe has also been embodied in an incredible mystery, the mystery of Jesus Christ. I am the way. Behold. I do a new thing. It is both the work of God and it is our calling. I think Bishop Michael is going to come back on. I'm coming back, Diana. I'm just a little slow. I'm stuck in an Ethernet cable right now, and I'm trying to squeeze my big body through it. <laughs> there, you made it. I'm back. I'm back. Oh, Diana, like preach, sister. That was that was so rich, and that you took it to that verse, which a lot of us struggled with and wrestled with. And to help us unpack that in such a new, refreshing way, that that was very, very helpful. You're going to be able to take some questions from folks that are here. Wonderful. I am. I am delighted to do that. Terrific. So I'm going to ask people to identify themselves, their names, in the chat function, and I will call upon you in turn, and then I will invite you to unmute your microphones. And as you're typing in there, uh, I'm going to remind you that Diana will be back with us tomorrow afternoon with tomorrow morning speaker Jeff Chu. And we're going to engage in some mediated conversations with them. Some of the questions you've already posted uh, in one of the conversations on the side, we will be using those for tomorrow's facilitated conversation. So I'm gonna call upon Sherry Coleman and Sherry I invite you to unmute yourself and identify yourself to Diana. I think Sherry's having the same Ethernet problem. <laughs> Michael, somehow you're muted again. Sorry, Sherry, are you there? Okay, we'll come back to you, Sherry. I'd like to call on Grant Swanson. Grant, would you unmute yourself, please, and identify yourself? 
Um, one of the challenges for the, the church is to uh, try and establish that its message is relevant for the, the people around us. Um, they may not necessarily be seeking the way. Um, and so I, I'm wondering what your, your thoughts are in, in terms of, of how one makes that message relevant to those about us, even our, our own children, um, who um, may not necessarily uh, be, be seeking the way. Yeah, I, I, th I, I, re I relate to the question in a lot of deep ways, you know, because I actually I'm the stepmom of a 30 year old and a, the mom of a 23 year old. So I have a closer sort of understanding of millennial and Gen Z culture and the anxieties about religion that are present in those generations. And also the United States, like Canada, you know, is in a really a quickly post-Christian setting where a lot of people are just rejected the Christianity and they just don't want to have much to do with it anymore. Uh, but what I would like to point out is I think that most people are looking for ways of joy and justice. So they might not necessarily equate that way with, with Jesus as the way, but they are looking for ways of healing, ways of liberation, ways of wholeness, um, ways of, 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 of deep meaning and, and joy. And so I think that that's where we have to be with people, that it's not an issue of just sort of standing on the corner and saying, you know, this is the way. Um, that's the, the sort of the, the thinking that I often grew up with. I spent a lot of time in evangelical churches when I was in my uh, teens and 20s. Uh, but to open towards the fact that we have stories that speak to ways that people are hungry for. And sometimes that means that we can speak with people about uh, ways of joy and justice and healing and wholeness and, and love and meaning without necessarily ever having them join in our way. But we can be faithful I think to the stories of, of Jesus, to the intentions of Jesus, to the hope that Jesus offers, if we are engaged in a conversation about uh, the hunger for ways toward a better life, toward a healed world. Because we share that, we share that with everyone. You know, it's just, it's just this week, I, I, I wore orange because of the the residential school thing in Canada. We're just starting in that process here in the United States. And today the um, George, the Derek Chauvin, the police officer who killed George Floyd was sentenced to 22 um, years in prison. And so racial justice, you know, people in North America are wanting to know that way. Um, not every single person, there are some poorly intentional you know, people with poor intentions who don't want that, but there are lots of people with good intentions who are not Christians who, who want a better way um, for those things. And also the fact that there was a ground temperature this week of 118 degrees in Vladivostok in Siberia. And um, I know you all, you know, we need a, we need a way um, out of this fractured, world that we have created and and you don't have to be a christian that for that either and so so i think that we have a story that speaks to those those ways of liberation and of healing um without exclusion and that's our challenge that's part of the challenge of this of this moment and i can't answer the question any better than that except we have to we we stand beautifully with the story we know and we stand with grace and humility with others who don't necessarily want to be part of the way, but who are seeking ways. And I'm happy, I'm happy to live in 
in that tension here in the early part of the 21st century. Thank you, Diana. I think Sherry is solved her microphone issue. Sherry, could you identify yourself, please? Not going to go. So Adam, can you read Sherry's question? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, Diana, Sherry asked, uh, thank you for taking the dualism out of law and gospel for allowing us to dwell in the breadth of Deuteronomy and its imagination. I'm wondering, how much are we doing a new thing simply by being present to how much we are wandering around right now, being in the liminal space? And wondering also if there is in this wandering a liberation, which allows us to return to the way of Jesus. Oh my gosh, I just love this question. I don't know who I, I don't know who Sherry is or what she does does Sherry, is. Sherry is a newly ordained deacon. Oh wow. Who, who heads the Center for Media and Spirituality at Martin Luther University College. Oh my gosh. Well Sherry, I'm I I'm just I'm blown I'm she's blown the one away. Who writes those Lutherans Connect devotions that you see on my Twitter feed. Oh, oh, I read those frequently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, that is just a that's a beautiful question, and um, I think that one of the things that's really interesting about it is that we have often seen the wilderness, the wandering in the wilderness of Israel, as the liminal period. Um, but you know, they were out there for a long time. 40 years. Uh, and that's a lot of liminality. And I think what happened to them is that it got to be kind of the new normal. And so I actually suspect, you know, that the liminal period in the, the, the Deuteronomy passage that I talk about here is not the wilderness because the wilderness was what they were used to. The wilderness had become incredibly familiar to them. They were probably wearing masks in the wilderness and socially distancing and all those kinds of things because they just got used to the, the odd thing being the normal thing. And then, you know, they're looking out over the promised land. And so I think that just this, this scene on the mountain in Deuteronomy is the liminal moment. And, um, and what do you do there? Well, what happens there, of course, in, in Deuteronomy, which I think is astonishing and so full of wisdom for right now, is that there's teaching, uh, of course, that Moses does. He's reminding them of, of all that they have learned in this kind of weird thing that they thought was temporary but became kind of permanent. And so he's reminding them of that. But he's also there. The act of memory and storytelling is so powerful there. And I, I think that that's a big part of what liminal times are about. I think they're, they're about reminding us who we really are, what our story is. And then the piece that, of course, is the the, the love of God and love God's ways and keep the commands, the statutes, the laws, is that basically Moses is reminding them of who they are. Um, Moses is reminding them that they, that this is their fundamental identity. He's reminding them of the basics, as it were, that make up the, the, the people of Israel. And so, so when I read this passage, I, I get very excited about it because I, I think to myself, there is a way that, you know, we've been in the wilderness, as it were, or we think we've been in the wilderness. It's part of the way that I, I often hear mainline liberal Protestant types um, talk about the decline in their churches is sort of like this. Oh, back in the 1960s, the 1970s, that was so, 50s even, you know, before, before, in the before times, you know, it was so wonderful, you know. Too bad we were sort of enslaved to the culture um, or that we were enslaved to middle class values, but it, it was wonderful. Our churches were big. Everything was great. Sunday school rooms were full. Oh, when Those were the old days. And then came the exile, the decline in Christianity, people getting really mad about about church, people leaving. And so then we think, oh, my gosh, that's the wilderness. And what's happened is, see, that B 
becomes our kind of wilderness. And we think, thought, oh, well, we have to get to a new promised land. Oh, we have to get to this new place where the church is going to be so big and wonderful and amazing again. And we're going to be in charge of everything. And, and it's all kind of going to go back to normal. And I think that is a complete misreading of this whole story. I just, I think that the wilderness became for Israel um, a kind of a new normal. And the liminal place is them looking out over this beautiful land that they're going to go into. And in the liminal space is memory and a calling towards their deepest sense of identity to be people of the law, the beauty of the law, the people who embody the breath of God in their community. And it's that that embodiment that they're going to carry with them into the promised land, that is what is going to bring forth life and goodness. It's not that it's just sort of, sort of magical place where everything is going to bloom and everything's going to be wonderful and it's perfect and it's going to be just the way it, we've always dreamed or like, like we think it should be. Um, but to go into and enter that space with that transformation through memory and story and recalling the presence of God in the camp of Israel. And so that's kind of where I think we are right now is that we've been in a weird place. We kind of normalized it. We have sort of maybe worried, Oh, that's the wilderness. We're going to get over it. It's just is what it is. We've been there for a long time now, 40 years, 50 years, whatever it is. And now we're in this, I think we're in an interesting liminal space. I think we've been thrown there by our culture, by the pandemic, by the violence, by all of the, the, the authoritarian impulses that are surrounding us by the decline of democracy, by all of this stuff. We we're, we're, we're on this mountain and we're looking out over this new, this new place and it's not magic out there we're going to go there and we're going to take hopefully who we really are in god embodied in god's love and love of neighbor thank you diana roy tacker joe please unmute yourself Thank you very much, uh, Dan, for the presentation. Um, I must confess it is uh, challenging to me, uh, who probably stand on the conservative end <laughs> in my theology. Um, and so I want to raise a question um, in that light. Um, in John chapter 14, when Jesus speaks about, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, it was in response to a question which in itself came in response to what he had said, that he, comforting the disciples, uh, I go to prepare a place for you. And then the question is, we don't even know where you're going. How do we know the way? He says, I am the way. I kind of get, and maybe I mistake me, so the impression um, that you're speaking of a way and ways, ways of justice, ways of different things. Uh, Excuse me. And here we're talking about the way. And I get the impression like uh, we're talking about way as if that is the destination in itself and not a way to the destination. And I, I feel when Jesus speaks of the way, it has to be to. And so we, I, I, I don't know that we can eliminate that destination aspect of it. You talk about whether it's a way to heaven or whatever. Um, I think it has, in my mind, it is, Jesus is the way. And um, he says it clearly, I'm the way, the truth, and life, no one comes to the Father, except, and you explain except in, in a way. Um, mm -hmm. My own impression is sometimes we tame the gospel to fit our contexts in trying to, to, to not look as if we are exclusive. 
Yeah, you know, I actually think that we have tamed the gospel to privilege Christianity over other religions. And so so I think that there the way that that reading this verse with that kind of exclusivistic um eye has been a, a way of uh, of for many centuries uh, the church maintaining control, hierarchy, um, and its power over culture by simply casting other um, options and other readings of it um, to the wind. And um, I, 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 I don't think when I, I don't think that the way is a destination. I think it is actually. I think it's pretty clear in the Gospel of John. The way is a relationship, and that kind of throws the whole passage into a really interesting sort of you can even have a much more conservative reading of that i mean if you want to use those those words i actually am taking this passage incredibly seriously and have read it and struggled with the language and thought about it and wrestled with the greek and on and on and on for years and years um and so so i'm not like I, I'm, I'm not just throwing this to some cultural wind and what it happens to be convenient for me um I've actually really wrestled with this. What does it mean? And and you can, it's not liberal versus conservative. I think it's that we've put on sets of lenses that, like I said for a moment ago, that privileged Christianity very deeply. And that's that's the way that it has been read um, in Christian history. And, and I worry about that um, in this day and age. Uh, not because of the culture, but because I think that a fair reading of Christian history shows that it has been used to um, hurt people and uh, to back imperial claims and and really put the church in a place of power that has undermined its essential message of love. And so, so I worry about those things um, as cultural realities in reading this text so I, I conservative or liberal people bring cultural stuff to the interpretation of that passage as i was going to finish up just a moment ago the um the central point of it is is that jesus is pointing the disciples towards the relationality of the way when jesus points to himself and says i am the way he is pointing out that the way is known in relationship the way is known in following Jesus. The way is known in this friendship with God through through Christ. It's not a destination. It's a relationship. You know, in a sense, you know, it's the same way. You know, same thing. I would say, you know, my my husband has been a, the way of life for me over the years, the twenty plus years we've been married, um, and our relationship has deepened and changed and taught me more and more about love and taught me how to live and taught me how about goodness and taught me how to be in the world and taught me how to be a better neighbor and all this sort of stuff. And so I think that when we talk about way and, and, and relationship, it's not a destination. We don't know where that's going to go. As a matter of fact, it changes a lot um, as we move through life and the relationship develops and deepens and takes us to new places. And I think that the Jesus is just saying that I might not be here anymore. You know, I might, I might die. Uh, but that relationship, that friendship, that love is going to remain and it is going to continue to be transformative and it is going to continue to take you to a place of life and goodness as was the promise um, of Moses um, and uh, Jeremiah and the gospel of Matthew. Thank you. Diana, can we do a couple more? I've got two more people in the queue. Sure. You I'm, want to hang in with us? Awesome. I'm here. I'm here. Iris, Iris, please unmute yourself. Yes. Hello, Diana. Can you hear me? I can. Excellent. So I'm Iris Schweiger. I'm, uh, I made a pact with God, and that's how I became the president of our church. I hate shopping. So I told him if I never have to go shopping again, I will become a president, and that's been my life. So... <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much for just taking the pressure out of absolutely everything. I love that. Um, and what I heard you saying at some point in time, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but 
So social justice or activism in social justice is the way of Jesus. That's number one, which I would like to know an answer to. And the second one is I've, I've been struggling for a long time with the concept of, on the one hand, I understand as a Lutheran, I know I'm saved by grace alone. No matter what I do, it's not going to get me closer to heaven or whatever. Um, how, but what I notice for myself is the only way I really meet and know Jesus is through activism, is through meeting my neighbor. And now I would also like to know, um, have we been reading this all wrong the whole time? Were we actually not supposed to put on the brakes, but be activists all along? Oh, gosh, what a great question. Um, justice is the way of God, the way, uh, uh, and Jesus came embodying the presence of God in the world. Justice is the way of Jesus. And of course, what justice is, is the making of things right. The, the, the justifying work, lining up what is supposed to be the case um, in in the world, and so um, so so yes, justice is the work of God. Blessed are the poor, you know. I, I mean, literally, we can go through those scriptures forever, but 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 Jesus cares deeply about justice. And um, as to the 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 other point um, about activism and grace, um, you know, I think that. It's that is actually, I think, one of the most amazing and wonderful mysteries of, of Protestantism, because I don't I don't believe that our 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 activism saves us. I really do do believe that 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 God, God's gifts and God's grace are constantly I mean, I actually think that that's the, the, the creative nature of the whole of the cosmos is this the, the pulsing never ceasing searching love of God, the compassion of God that is running through all things at all time. And that's what we, what we refer to as, as grace. And that, it, that, and that grace reaches to every corner of the universe. And so, so when we are saved, I mean, healed, made whole, rescued, redeemed, liberated, of course we are saved by that. That is the loving impulse of everything. And so what happens, I think, in the story, uh, uh, and this is, I think, very a very Lutheran way of seeing it, is that it, during the, the 16th century, Catholics came back, of course, at, at Luther and early Protestants and said, well, wait a second, if you say grace alone, then why would you ever do anything? You know, why would you ever you can do whatever you want, you know, go steal a pig, you know, it's not going to matter because you're going to be saved. Um, you know, cause it's all grace alone. So you just, you know, lay back on your laurels and, and do nothing. Um, and the response of early Protestants was to sort of rearticulate um, the, the overwhelmingness of grace. Uh, but then also to say, well, but if a person has really been redeemed, made whole, uh, liberated by grace, what do you want to do? And that's, see, that, that's a fascinating ethical question. It's like, do you want to just sit in your closet for the rest of your life? Do you want to steal a pig? Probably not. If indeed you have really encountered this pulsating love of God, this compassion that is at the center of the whole of the cosmos, um, you're probably going to want to do something about it. Um, and that something is to love everybody else, is to reach out in love, to heal people, to uh, make sure people aren't, aren't hungry, to visit prisoners, to, to embrace the poor. I mean, it's, oh my gosh, to cry over the bodies of, of children that have have lain without recognition for a hundred years. I mean, what do you want to do? What you're going to do is you're going to go out into the streets and you're going to start demonstrating that love of God. And that love of God is when justice and mercy kiss, that's 
that's that's or when 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 mercy and 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 justice kiss that's the love of god so so mercy comes together with justice and that's the kingdom that's the behold i do new thing moment and so there is plenty for us to do um and it isn't just a miracle except that the miracle is, is that there is this universe that pulsates with the love of god now that we can't do anything to create that just is and so what we get to do is our eyes get to be open to it we get to encounter it in one another we get to sense it in prayer we hear it in the beautiful stories that we're told through the scriptures we i mean we through bread and wine the meals that we serve oh my gosh it comes at us over and over and over and again and every time we we figure out we've run into it it changes us we become saved all over and then we do something what do you want to do i don't want to steal a pig <laughs> <laughs> maybe go sit in the closet sometime <laughs> we got one more diana rob wiesner is in the queue rob you and galen got the first word when we gather tonight you're going to get the <laughs> He's hopefully falling asleep right now. <laughs> oh, oh, you're the dad of the little kid. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's he was so more. cute. So yeah, cute. Yeah, there's three more. <laughs> um, thank you, Diana, for being here. It's been a wonderful pleasure to hear you speak, and uh, your answers are just really amazing and thought provoking. Um, one of the things that's come to my mind uh, over the years of studying and being a pastor and hearing many different people ask questions. Um, I'm still amazed at the number of people that kind of go, huh, when you say that Jesus was Jewish. Um, <laughs> I know well, it's amazing, but, isn't it, really? Yeah, like, there's too many things that want to come out of my mouth right now, so I'm going to try to, uh, you know, to get it all out in one way. Um, one of the things that I've, there's, there's a wonderful parable of the Buddha, or a story about the Buddha, who preaches a sermon to a crowd, and to emphasize his point, he points up at the moon and only one person in the crowd looks up at the moon, everybody else is looking at his finger. And I think sometimes we as a Christian religion are often looking at the finger and not what the finger is pointing to. Jesus, as a faithful first century Jew, I don't think would ever have said the things that we say he said about himself. You know, when I hear those I am sayings, going back to the Old Testament, you know, I am is the name, the unspeakable name of God. Perhaps Jesus is pointing and saying, God is the way, God is the truth, God is the life. Because if he pointed to himself, he would be very guilty of blasphemy and that would have been really bad. Um, so part of my commentary, and I guess my question here is, do we as Christians need to know our Judaism and our Hebrew Bible better? Because if that's what inspired Jesus to do what he did, he was pointing beyond himself, but we're caught looking at him. Look at all these doctrines and dogma. You know, he loses his whole humanity as though he's just some second person of a trinity. You know, um, how do we not get caught staring at the finger and actually go out and learn our Judaism? And, you know, if, if we're going to try to figure out what Jesus was talking about, don't we need to understand Judaism and the, the great stories that shaped him better so that we can kind of... Because he did something very Jewish, and yet we somehow turned it into something profoundly Christian and we've gotten rid of our Jewish roots in many ways, yeah, you know, and yet there's a great disconnect there. So how do we reconnect? Yeah, I, I'm very, I, I, I love, I love your, your observations and your question. And a lot of my life changed about, oh, I think it was about 12 or 15 years ago. Now I was leading a retreat where I was invited by a group of rabbis <laughs> to lead their retreat. And I was the only Christian there and I was with them for like three days uh, three and a half days and um it was wonderful and at one point in the retreat i i was just so moved and i i said to one of the rabbis oh my gosh i want to be jewish and he said to me um you follow jesus right and i said yes i do and he said he was a rabbi follow him he was a good one you're okay and it was like the this rabbi gave me a gift of 
being a Christian, of being a Jesus follower, um, recognizing that Jesus was my rabbi. And um, I, I loved that moment. And it really sort of plunged me back toward reading um, he, the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. And I became very good friends with that rabbi. And um, our friendship is absolutely sustained. He says that I'm like one of his favorite Christians in the world. As a matter of fact, I'm the only Christian who's on his synagogue's approved reading list. And every time I have a book come out, um, I get invited to go to the synagogue and preach on it. And I just have so much fun. And it's a, it's this wonderful, amazing activist uh, synagogue here in Washington, D.C. with a really deep spiritual life. And he, he even invited my family to his family Seder. I mean, it's not just like the, 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 the synagogue's sort of Seder, but his family Seder one year. And it was like, oh, and so, so, so I got, I, I, I've learned so much from him and our friendship has just been incredibly wonderful. Now, all that said is one of the other things I've learned from him is that I'm a Christian and I'm not a Jew. And that means that we Christians have a rabbi who was truly Jewish. Um, but out of that story, and out of the story of Paul, who was also Jewish, and all almost all the authors of the New Testament who were also Jewish, um, they also wrote a sort of a, a different midrash, a different sort of set of rituals and different interpretations of that Jewish story that that is told in the Old Testament. And so we bear 2,000 years of midrash on top of Jesus being my rabbi. Um and there's a complexity and a beauty of that and a truthfulness of that that arises from the experience of 2,000 years of community and people wrestling with it and trying to figure out how to live the sort of basic teachings of Jesus and the embodied life of God in Jesus through an incredible number of cultural settings. And so I, I kind of, I hold the Jewishness of Jesus is incredibly significant and important to who I understand myself to be and Chris, what, what Christianity becomes to be. Uh, but I also recognize that to say that I was Jewish would be to be wrong. It would be appropriation because I'm not that. I really am a Christian. And I stand in a different line of midrash, a different line of interpretation. Um, and so th that's kind of my best answer is that yes, we need to learn and pay attention and also pay incredible attention to the anti-Semitic impulses of Christianity, which are legion, and um, take that as important as we take other forms of racism um, it, at this moment when we're dealing with these things. And frankly, it's one of the reasons I wrote the new book, because you know, one of the things I wanted to free Jesus of were what I called the accretions, you know, the things that everybody told me I was supposed to believe about Jesus um, instead of going back to what I knew to be true of Jesus uh, through both my experience. Uh, my experience of Jesus started before I knew how to read, before I ever recited a creed, before I ever knew anything about theology. because so I was baptized when I was three months old. And I think that Jesus is one of the first names I knew besides those of my friends and my parents. And so um, I wanted to free Jesus from a whole bunch of stuff that had kind of gotten in the way. And so I think that we do need to see Jesus really clearly as Christians. Um, but I also think that we need to see Jesus clearly differently than sometimes we have. Lovely. Thank you so much, Diana. The responses have been following along the chat line. People are really, really engaged. And I'm so looking forward to continuing our conversation with you and with Jeff tomorrow afternoon. I hope that people really heard one of the things that I am always trying to do is bust out of those conservative versus liberal things. I think that is so unhelpful and it just gives us a chance to stereotype each other. And, you know, for the conservative gentleman, the conservative gentleman who was just challenging me on the, the, the way I interpret those verses, 
I love Jesus. <laughs> you know, and anybody who reads my books knows that. And I have been hopefully tonight refreshing you in that deep sense of identity in Jesus in the same way that Moses called for that memory and that refreshment of identity is that we Christians need to be refreshed into the idea of the incarnated, the embodied, the embodiedness of God in Jesus. And that is such a special and amazing story for us to carry as part of our identity as we look into whatever the promised land is of the future.